Great to have you. Hey, Hugh. Good to be on with you. I, uh, I want to begin by uh, a subject I discussed with Michael Shear, the New York Times, and Philip Recker, the Washington Post. The president's U.N. speech yesterday, uh, unprecedented. Uh, first time, I believe, that an American president has used the podium at the U.N. to attack a domestic political opponent. Uh, one, is your recollection the same as mine? I haven't fact-checked it thoroughly yet. And two, what do you make of that? Yeah, pretty remarkable, Hugh, that uh, Barack Obama went and stood in the well of the General Assembly and took not so veiled swipes at political adversaries at home. Um, like you, I can't remember any president ever doing that. There are just certain norms of American politics and international politics. Uh, there's place, there's a time, there's a place for partisan politics down on the campaign trail, uh, and then there's a time for statesmanship. And when you're representing our country, when you're the head of our head of state for the United States of America and you're traveling abroad or you're speaking at the U.N. General Assembly, that's not the time to take swipes at your domestic political opponents. It's time to call yeah. for greater leadership uh, and greater cooperation in the world to address our shared security challenges, not to engage in partisan politics. President Obama's politicization of everything, Senator Cotton, has become the new normal, so much so that this was not remarked upon anywhere. There were lots of coverage of his attack on Trump, but all, I, I didn't see anyone note that it was an unprecedented partisan domestic political attack in the U.N. Uh, has he... Are, are we just used to him doing, like Harry Reid, you know, I, I don't expect you to call the minority leader a liar, but he lied again, like he lied about Mitt Romney's taxes, about Donald Trump. Uh, and I, I, I don't credit anything that Harry Reid says, but that's the new normal. Nobody does, but it's the new normal. I think it's almost bizarre. I think, you know, for, for eight years, you a lot of people can forget traditional norms uh, that came before uh, Barack Obama. But it's not appropriate, uh, and I would hope that Donald Trump, if he wins, will restore some of those old norms. Um, you know, you could see in his trip to Mexico last month that uh, he understood some of those basic norms of American and international politics. Uh, when he was in Mexico uh, with the president of Mexico, he spoke in a restrained fashion, uh, more like a statesman than a political candidate. Later in the day, he was back on the campaign trail and reiterated some of his basic uh, you know, themes for the campaign. Uh, but, I, but I hope that Donald Trump, if he wins this race, will help restore store some of those older norms uh, of politics that were shared by both parties. Now, Senator, I want to turn to uh, the end of the year business. I read a story yesterday that the Senate is hopeful of passing a minibus, uh, a continuing res resolution till December. And I want to know what it does to the military. I got an email last night from a retired two star Marine general who is a young lieutenant at the end of the Carter years, the beginning of the Reagan years. And he wrote it was a bit of a different time. I had asked him about the comparison we were in the Vietnam hangover, and the rundown of the armed forces had been ongoing for a long time. We had a national culture that was pretty ambivalent, quite too anti-military. But there was Sam Nunn in a Congress overhaul that by, had bipartisan support for a national strategy in the armed forces. We now have a settled divide between the parties and, frankly, a significant decline in the GOP for understanding and commitment to a strong national defense. In an odd way, Trump could be more successful in generating energy in support than a normal politician. The question will be, does he gain understanding and build for himself a strategic framework? That's a much harder to assess question. So in that context of we need a national strategy and resources, what do you think is happening in the minibus with the Pentagon? Well, probably nothing in, in a short-term bill that we're going to pass uh, this week or next week, Hugh, uh, for, the, uh, for the military, and that's because the Democrats have continued to block any increase in military spending, even if it's consistent with the budget agreement that was announced last week, or I'm sorry, last year, because they want more domestic spending as well. That's a really unprecedented position in American politics. Uh, Democrats like Scoop Jackson and Joe Lieberman and many others uh, for decades, you know, acknowledge that while they might want more domestic spending, they shouldn't make defense spending contingent upon it. I do hope that we will be able to fund uh, the Department of Veterans Affairs and some important military construction projects in this short-term bill. And then in December, we'll be able to give the military the appropriate levels of funding and long-term uh, security that it needs, and certainty that it needs. But ultimately, as Donald Trump said uh, in his speech about the military a couple weeks ago, we need substantial increases. We need an emergency supplemental spending bill in uh, the winter of next year, uh, probably to the tunes of, of tens of billions of dollars. And then in the long term, we need several hundreds of billions of dollars to make sure that our troops are ready to fight today and that they're the best equipped and have the best weapons and technology tomorrow. Okay, over at Real Clear Defense is a Lauren Thomas piece uh, on the need for more aircraft carriers. Do you agree with that, um, Senator Cotton? 
I do. You know, we are uh, barely able to keep 12 aircraft carriers fully up and functional, uh, which means based on the, the way the math of aircraft carriers works and their deployment, their redeployment, training and, and refit, it, it's hard to keep aircraft carriers in the Mediterranean, in the Persian Gulf, in East Asia at a time when our adversaries are continuing to challenge us more and more and more. These ships are more capable than they ever have been, but you know they can't be in two places at one time. They can't be in the Persian Gulf and the South China Sea. So it's a cliche, but it's a cliche for a reason that in any moment of crisis, the president asks where those aircraft carriers are, because that is the most effective way that the United States can project power around the world on an instantaneous basis. Now, he's at the Lexington Institute, Lauren Thompson is, and he'd previously been the deputy director of security studies at Georgetown. And he writes what I think, what is, this is a quote, what is increasing is the utility of carriers in responding to a growing array of global challenges. Roughly 80% of the world's population lives within 100 miles of the sea, so having a fleet of floating air bases that can destroy hundreds of targets per day for months at a time without requiring access to land facilities is useful. In fact, the large deck nuclear-powered aircraft carriers are the signature combat system. They are also the signature relief system that we deploy, Senator Cotton. And I'm, I'm amazed we're down to 10 carrier groups. I'm just amazed. Yeah, and ultimately, probably, you'd say that given the, the security challenges we face, and here, as you cite, some of the disasters uh, that we've seen around the world in terms of earthquakes and tsunamis that our carriers help grant relief to, to, to build goodwill for Americans, uh, we'd probably need 16 carrier groups in the long term. Now, it will take a long time to get to that because it takes a long time to build a carrier, even if you're doing it right and doing it quickly and on budget. But ultimately, given the math uh, for the way carrier deployments uh, occur, if you want four out at sea at any time, you really need to have 16 carrier groups. Uh, okay, Senator Cotton, last question. We have um, unrest in North Carolina. I'll report on that next hour after a police shooting last night. We have the Tulsa shooting. Uh, race relations back on the front burner if they ever left the front burner. Uh, what do you think the president and the candidates ought to say about this, if anything? Hugh, I spent much of August traveling around Arkansas visiting with law enforcement officials of all types, police officers, sheriffs, deputies. I uh, went to a federal prison, visited with prosecutors. Um, and the one thing I heard consistently is that they want officers to be held accountable. They want officers to be defended uh, when their use of force is justified, and they want to hold officers accountable if the use of force is not justified. What that means is that we as elected officials have to call for calm uh, and deliberation anytime there's an officer-involved use of force, because we rarely get all the facts at the outset. That's one of the lessons I learned in the Army, that first reports are often or even usually wrong. Even if you have video, it often doesn't tell the full story. So elected leaders should call for calm and try to ease tensions while the neutral and independent fact-finding inquiries that occur anytime there's an officer-involved use of force, especially a shooting, occur. Because as we've seen in places like Baltimore and Ferguson, once all the facts are known, the officers are justified in their use of force. So Barack Obama, the two presidential candidates, all elected leaders at all levels need to do everything they can not to divide communities, not to fan the flames of racial tension while the facts are ascertained and then deliberate conclusions can be drawn. Senator Tom Cotton, always good to talk to you. Thank you, Senator. I'll be seeing you around back in D.C. after a weekend in New York coming up. I appreciate your, your chat, and I'll see you soon.